Hello world and welcome to Web Dev Frontiers. My name is Tomasz and I'm here to share my experience with you in web technologies. Now, one of the most viewed videos on this channel so far are about some underutilized and underrepresented HTML elements and attributes. So I thought to cater for this, I'm going to now record yet another video where I'm going to share a couple of additional HTML elements that are in my view are underrepresented or not as well known as some others. So if you're ready to learn about these, let's go ahead and jump straight in. And the very first element that I'm going to be talking about is called the data element. Now I've added an example here where I also applied some styles, but we're not going to really care about the styling for this particular example. But notice that I'm using the data element here in between some regular divs and some h2s and paragraphs. So one way of using the data element is of course to provide machine readable data within the browser. And that's really good because you can actually display the content that you wish, which is human readable, and you can also attach values and meanings to those products or whatever else you're trying to represent in a way that is also readable for a machine. And of course, you can also utilize some JavaScript to then read the data properties, but data properties are actually a little bit different than the data element. So data properties allow you to attach arbitrary values to your HTML elements. And this is how that would look like. So data dash product dash ID, for example. And then later on, you can basically access that by selecting the button and then going to the data set property and then read the product ID and notice that every time when you use a dash, so for example, product dash ID would then become product ID with the I capitalized. Okay, so I'm showing actually two things here, but the main point here is being the data element where you can combine human and machine readable data together. So if we open this particular example up in our browser, then we'll see this is how it looks like. So I do have the value and both the currency here. There's nothing special. As I said, it's human readable. But if I now get a machine to read this HTML, it will be able to understand that this is, for example, a currency with a value of 12.99 and the currency is United States dollars. The next element that I would like to show you is called the details element. And here you can see I'm using it where we use the details element as well as the summary element. Now this details element basically allows us to display a summary element and its content only when we actually click on the details element. And if you look here, there's absolutely no JavaScript added to this page. What I'm using is some CSS code here to make sure that the details element and the summary are collapsed or open. So there's zero JavaScript added. It's all manipulated by CSS and standard HTML. So let's open up this example in the browser and see how it looks like. And there you have it. I have this click to expand and another section element. You can see that I have a chevron pointing downwards. If I click on it, then now I see the summary element and I see the other content coming from the summary element as well. Or to be a little bit more precise, and if I show this to you side by side, you can see that the click to expand is the actual text that we see here, which we need to click on. And then the content is then inside this div here that says this is the hidden content, etc., etc. And then we have the another section, and then we have the paragraph in here that says here's some more hidden content. Okay, so we can very easily achieve this functionality, as I said, just by using pure CSS and HTML without any need for JavaScript. This next one is not actually an HTML element, but rather an attribute. And this HTML attribute is called the title attribute. And here you can see that I'm using it. And basically, we can add some very basic tooltip text. So I have a div, I have a title attribute added to the div, and the title attribute just says this is a tooltip. So let's go ahead and take a look at this in the browser. And this is how it would look like. So we have the hover over me text here. So if I hover my mouse over it, then after a second or two, I get the this is a tooltip message. Now, of course, 
this may not be ideal because this text is relatively small, but I thought I would show this to you as well. Of course, a much better way to achieve tooltips would be to create some sort of a CSS or logic behind the scenes. And that's exactly what this particular span element is going to do. So I have a class called tooltip text added to this span. You can go ahead and look up the appropriate CSS rules for this. I'm going to link to the GitHub repository later on. And if we save this and if we go back to the browser, you will see that the functionality is a lot different because now we get this is the tooltip text, which is much larger, much more prominent. Of course, I kind of placed it to the wrong place because it goes on top of the h1 text that we have here. But now notice we also have the title text added as well as the tooltip text. OK, so now it's up to you which sort of version you want. But as I said, one is usable without CSS, but you can't format that text. It's always going to be very small. The other one, you get the full blown CSS customization opportunity for that. And so if that's more suitable for your use case, well, by all means, go ahead and use that approach. This next element is the WBR element, which is basically short for word breaking opportunity. So with this element, you can basically instruct the browser to insert word breaks, even if it wouldn't do it on its own. So I have two examples here. One is a very long compound word where we just have a span element and we basically specify this word, which I'm not going to pronounce or say out loud for very obvious reasons. And then we have another example where I'm using the WBR element to specify a word break opportunity. And so you can see we can basically split up this particular word into multiple pieces. Now, also notice that this entire sample is added to a container div and we're going to change the width of the container div at a later point in time, or rather, I'm sorry, we're going to change the max width property on the body and see how the two samples, one without the WBR and one with the WBR is going to change. OK, so let's take a look at this in the browser right now. And notice that without the WBR element, we just get the actual text printed in one single line. Now, of course, what if we would like to sort of have more like a book like feature where we can split the word into logical pieces and notice how that actually works, because we've specified a word breaking opportunity after the letter I. So if I go back to the code, you can see that we said there should be a word breaking opportunity. OK, so let's change the max width to, say, 600 pixels, for example, and go back to the browser and see how things change. Well, in this case, both of these options look exactly the same because now we have enough space to display the text. But let's now shrink the container and see what happens then. And I'm going to shrink it to just 200 pixels, go back to the browser, and this is, I think, where the WBR element becomes really, really prominent. So now, without it, we can see that we have an overflowing content, so it will be very difficult to fix. But with WBR, we were able to specify not one, but two word breaking points. And that's because we've specified one after the word super and one after Piali in this case, whatever that may mean. So if I go back to my code now, you can see that, in fact, after super, we have WBR and after all the actually we have WBR. OK, so at any point in time, anywhere where you see the WBR element, that is going to indicate a word breaking opportunity. And this is very good for sort of complex words such as this one or more for Latin words that can be really, really long or sort of for a website that deals with, say, medical science, for example, where, you know, very long words can appear. This could be a very nice way to sort of specify this word breaking opportunity, especially for sites that must be viewed on mobile as well as desktop. So now we have this nice responsive way to sort of shrinking down a container, but also making sure that the words, especially long words, would apply line breaks correctly. The next example is going to be the bidirectional override or the BDO element. Very simply put, the BDO element allows us to change the default text direction from left to right to right to left. And I have four examples. 
The first two are with Latin characters. So we're going to have Hello World with the default text direction, which is going to be the usual left to right direction that we are used to in Europe and North America and, and many, many other places in the world. Then I'm going to use the BDO element with a DIR attribute, which is the direction. And as you can see, we have RTL, which is right to left. So we'll see that Hello World is actually going to be printed the other way around. And of course, there are some languages out there, such as Hebrew and Arabic, for example, that would require you to use this BDO element because the text in Hebrew and Arabic would go from right to left as opposed to left to right. So I have these two examples here as well. So again, BDO element with DIR RTL saying Ani Ohev Otach which is I love you in Hebrew. And then we also have the Arabic version, Ana Uhibuki, which is I love you in Arabic. So let's take a look at how this code would look like in the browser. Okay, so here we have our normal text, which is Hello World. Then we have right to left using BDO, and you can see the text Hello World is now reversed. But of course, when we look at the Hebrew and the Arabic version of the text, then they basically allow a native reader or anyone who can read Hebrew and Arabic to read it from right to left, which is how these two languages should be written. And last but not least, this last element is really something else, to be honest with you. This one is called the Ruby element. Now, first, when I heard about this element, I thought maybe it allows me to annotate Ruby code and you know Ruby gems and all that, but it turns out that I was really, really completely wrong. So the Ruby element allows us to denote East Asian text and it allows us to show pronunciation guides for these East Asian languages. So for example, Japanese and Chinese and, and there are many, many others, of course. And I have two examples to show you, one for Japanese and one for Chinese here. So you can see I'm using the Ruby element and I have the RT element, which represents the actual Latin text for any East Asian character. So the first example here is the Japanese example. The second example here is going to be the Chinese example. And you can see, for example, in the Chinese example, I have the Chinese letters and then in between the RT elements, which are all a child of the Ruby element and they are also child of the RP element, which basically allows us to print fallback elements for Ruby. And what I have in between here are the so-called pinning characters, which is kind of the Latin version of the Chinese characters, if that makes sense. All right, so let's take a look at this in the browser and see how this would show up. And this is it. So now we have the Japanese text here, Aishteru which means I love you in Japanese. And then in the second example, we have wo ai ni, which again means I love you in Chinese. But you can see that I have the pinning characters printed on top of the actual Asian characters, which is really, really great. Now, if you're curious, the term Ruby comes from typography. And in fact, it is a typography measurement. And I think one Ruby is equal to 5.5 typography points. So this is just some additional context for you. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this video where I shared a couple of underrepresented HTML elements and a single attribute with you. If you have more such examples, then I would love to hear them. Please add them in the comment section below. Otherwise, if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. And of course, it would be great if you could subscribe to the channel for more such content. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.